All right. Last week, we jumped into our, our new series called Splash, Jumping into Life with Purpose and Passion. And we uh, began last week with Jesus in the upper room, with the disciples as they were about to uh, experience the Passover feast together. Jesus began to teach the disciples, not with words first, but with actions. And those actions were to take a towel of a servant, wrap it around his waist, take a, a basin, and begin to wash the disciples' feet. Uh, an act not for a Jewish rabbi, but for maybe a Jewish, maybe a Gentile slave. Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and as he finishes washing the disciples' feet, he said, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. He wanted to make sure that the disciples, and Peter in particular, knew that his desire was for them to be washed by him, to be loved by him, to be served by Jesus. And so we said in, this, in the last week's message that our purpose, according to Jesus in the upper room, is to fully receive God's love, to know his love from the inside out that changes us, for us to never stop experiencing the love of Christ that is redemptive and restorative and forgiving and gracious and accepting. That God loves us and we need to be reminded of his love in our lives. And so to fully receive God's love. And secondly, to intentionally give our lives away in service to others. Jesus set an example that we should also do that. Not just to know that Jesus set us an example, but actually to do it. So give our lives away. And then thirdly, that, uh, that we live humbly with the blessing of significance. You'll be blessed if you do these things. That blessing, happiness, joy comes not from the things around us that promise happiness, but from that sense of satisfaction that our lives have a purpose. That there's a calling on our lives. There's something beyond ourselves that we've been made for. So we're called to make a splash in the lives of people around us. In the weeks ahead, we're going to take a look at our calling to the places and the people where God already has sent us or maybe will call us will send us to new places, but the places and the people that God has sent us to. And in a couple weeks, we're going to take a look at our profile, that each of us have been uniquely shaped in order to make a splash. And this week and next week, I want to talk about our partnership. Our partnership with God that Jesus describes in John chapter 15 as a relationship, a uh, a a vital relationship, literally a vital relationship of the vine and the branches where God the Father is the gardener. So if you'll turn with me, I think it's on page 985 of your pew Bible, if you brought your own Bible. John chapter 15. I'd like us to take a look at this agricultural image that Jesus introduces in the upper room as he's giving his last words to the disciples, as he's teaching them all they need to know as he is sending them into the world. In John chapter 15, I'm going to read verses 1 through 8 and then 16. Jesus teaches them this. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that's thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. You did not choose me, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. 
fruit that will last. There's so much that we could say about this passage. There's so much packed into these few verses of Jesus' teaching about being the vine and the branches. But for our purposes this morning in looking at our partnership with God, there's two things I want to, to highlight for us, two truths I think that Jesus is teaching to the disciples and to us. And the first is that our partnership with God produces lasting fruit of changed lives. Our partnership with God produces lasting fruit of changed lives. Jesus says, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. The point of our partnership with God is to bear fruit. And the fruit, according to Jesus, is much fruit and lasting fruit. The lasting fruit means that it's eternal fruit, that it has uh, eternal significance. It's important for us to understand what the fruit is a picture of what this vineyard is a picture of. God created an image as he called his people together in Israel. As he called his people together, he created an image for them of fruitfulness, of a vineyard that would bear fruit. This is lasting fruit. It is kingdom of God fruit. God called his people as a result of their partnership with him to display his character in obedience, to display his character in such a way that the world would experience God's fruit, the fruit of the kingdom. And so if your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, then the fruit of your life and of the community as you remain connected to God the Father would be that of loving kindness and mercy and justice and righteousness Caring for the forgotten, welcoming the stranger. It's lasting fruit. It's eternal fruit. And it's much fruit. This is fruit, not just for provincial Israel. This is fruit for the whole world. The prophet Isaiah writes this, Jacob will take root. Israel will bud and blossom and fill all the world with fruit. The fruitfulness of God displayed through his people. Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise of fruitfulness. He is the root of Jesse. And from him would come the, the demonstration of the kingdom of God, would be fulfilled in Jesus. And then God would send the followers of Jesus into the world to demonstrate that fruit. So in Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes this. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world. Just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. And please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. This fruitfulness is only understood in the context in which God communicates this image. So in the Old Testament, the fruitfulness of the people of Israel is compared to the fruitfulness of its neighbors, of Egypt, of Persia, the, the wealthiest nations in the world that would end up dominating Israel. And the question to Israel at the time was, do they trust in the fruitfulness of God and God's provision? Will they be faithful to their calling to be a nation? Or will they uh, go away to other nations that prove to be more fruitful? And their abundance, their prosperity, their peace their power, their protection. In the New Testament, as Jesus talks about bearing fruit and Paul talks about the fruit of the gospel being displayed in the whole world, what is the context of that fruitfulness? It's the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire promised fruitfulness to all of its citizens. If you were a Roman Empire, then you could be, if you were a Roman citizen, then you, by virtue of the fact that you pled you, you pledged allegiance to Caesar, you would benefit from the peace of Rome, the prosperity of Rome, 
the protection of Rome. This is what, what, what came with being a part of the Roman Empire. The fruitfulness of the Roman Empire, guaranteed to all of its citizens. And here you have the gospel that is bearing fruit. And the fruit that it bears is the peace of God and the prosperity of God. The, the power of God and the protection of God. And so if you had a choice between pledging allegiance to the Roman Empire that promises its fruitfulness or pro- pledging allegiance to the kingdom of God and its fruitfulness, which would you choose? Would the fruit of the gospel be compelling enough that you would risk losing the peace, the prosperity, the protection, and the power of the Roman Empire for the same in the kingdom of God? There must be a demonstration of the gospel that is compelling for someone to say, I choose this kingdom over that kingdom. And so the same is true in our day. How would you characterize the fruitfulness of In our context, what names or labels would you put on the fruitfulness of our age? How about HBO, ESPN, NBC? How about Disney, Coca-Cola, and Exxon? How about Hollywood and Broadway and Paris? The fruitfulness of this kingdom the fruitfulness of this world and all that it has to offer of peace and prosperity and power and protection, it would make a great campaign slogan, wouldn't it? The promises of this kingdom versus the promises of the gospel. And the same question remains in our world today. Is there enough evidence of the kingdom of God and its fruitfulness to be compelling enough to attach myself to that promise versus the promise of the fruitfulness of this world. This fruit is eternal fruit. Fruit that lasts. Fruit that offers salvation and hope. Eternal security. Forgiveness. Redemption. Do we believe that this fruit is worth bearing in our lives for the sake of the gospel? Because that's truly the choice. That's truly the the prophetic word of God's fruitfulness in his kingdom today. If I was speaking on this, preaching on this two years ago, I would have said that the fruit Jesus is referring to here is simply the fruit of the Spirit. And certainly, the fruit of the Spirit comes as we are connected because the fruit of the Spirit is simply His character in us. But it's more than that. This image that goes back to the Old Testament of the fruitfulness of God's people that is a demonstration of the reality of the reign of God is so central to what Jesus is preparing the disciples for. He wasn't preparing them for their own personal happiness as He was going to be crucified and they were going to be sent into the world but to be agents of the kingdom, to demonstrate the fruit of the gospel. So that's one truth I believe Jesus is teaching in this passage. The second is that our partnership with God matures through personal spiritual practices. Our partnership with God matures like fruit, like a, like a, a, a vine and its branches, through personal spiritual practices practices. According to Willow Creek Community Church, um, which is one of the largest uh, communi- Christian communities in the world and has, has done so much to uh, set the pace for uh, understanding how we do church, uh, did a, a study in the last couple years of 200 churches that volunteered to be a part of their study across the country, all different sized churches and different uh, flavors, denominations, non-denominational churches. And they asked people how they grew. Because they, as one of the largest churches in the world, uh, they were concerned. They saw this gap between 
what they hoped for people, what people hoped for themselves and what people were actually experiencing. And they wanted to know how is it that people actually go from being a seeker of Christ to becoming a Christ follower, to be Christ-centered. How do we, how do we actually grow? And so they did a study that re- called Reveal, and it actually revealed the ways that people actually grow. And this week I want to talk about some of the inward ways we grow, and next week I want to talk about some of the outward ways that we grow. As they did their study, they found out there's a few ways that people actually grow, and these aren't the main ways that are part of my points here, but I just want to share with you some ways that people uh, identified that they grew. One was uh, through counseling or support. They joined a support group. They went to individual counseling, and, and through that experience became uh, closer to God. They grew in their faith. Some people responded with, uh, I just did it on my own. I woke up one day and knew I was going in the wrong direction, and I really needed to get my life together. And so I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps, and I began to grow in my faith. Some people responded with a serving experience, and you can attest to this if you've ever been in a situation where you've been called to serve, and often when you're over your head in serving, you're building a house in Mexico, you're sitting with preschoolers at kids' games, you're, you're uh, preparing to go on a, a trip to Eastern Europe, and you go, I don't know what to do here, and I have to trust God, and we find out that we begin to grow as we depend on Him. A serving experience, and some people actually... Uh, grew uh, by switching churches, which is not something I recommend for anyone. (laughs) It it really can be hazardous to your health. It's a very, very bad, it's very bad, it's a bad thing. But, you know, sometimes a change of venue is is good for people. Sometimes you're in a church that's not so alive and you go to another church that is, or they're equally the same, but just a different change of venue caused people to change. But but that's not the most common, these are not the most common ways. These these were... uh, the responses were so uh, few compared to the greater responses that I'm going to share with you right now. These are three things that are, really are not rocket science, and I kind of wish they were. As I was going deeper into the study, I thought, okay, there's got to be something really earth-shattering here. And as I share these with you, you could probably you know, tell us yourself. I mean, you know what they are, so they're not new. It's not the concepts that are new. It's actually the consistent application of these concepts, these personal spiritual practices, these spiritual disciplines that actually cause people to grow. What they find is that, that each of us has to take responsibility at some point for our own spiritual growth. There's only so much that, that the, the church community can do for us in worship, small groups, opportunities to serve. There's only so much that actually happens until we actually own for ourselves uh, personal spiritual practices that will keep us connected to the vine, or else we become like branches that bear no fruit. So here's the first one. We practice, uh, we we grow in partnership uh, in solitude, listening to God's voice. We grow in solitude, listening to God's voice. John Ortberg has written a book called The Life You've Always Wanted. The life you've always wanted. And it's a a new look at spiritual disciplines. In one chapter, he talks about the the hurry disease, which many of us are afflicted with. The hurry disease. This is what keeps us from being still and knowing that God is God. This is the hurry disease where we we look to get things done as quickly as we possibly can. And and maybe uh, this is true for you. It's true for me. Uh, When I come to this major intersection near my house, uh, I always size up the lanes. Always size up the lanes. Not only see how many cars are in each lane, but, but what kind of car is in each lane. <laughs> Whether it looks like a really slow car or it looks like it's going to be a quick car. And, and uh, there's also a lane to the right of all of those lanes that are always filled. There's one that's always empty. And this one is sort of the, uh, it's the merge lane, but people use it as sort of the jet propulsion lane <laughs> That as soon as you hit a green light, man, you take off. And, and then it becomes a racetrack home, which is only one block for me. <laughs> but it becomes like a racetrack. And uh, I don't know if you ever do this, but I find myself, those people who take that right lane and try to merge in, like, oh, they were always there, right? Uh, you ever see the NASCAR drivers where they just, just, just a, little, a little nudge? It doesn't take like a crash, just a little nudge. To, to run them off the road. I've never done that, but, 
you, you want to do that. And, you know, I'm sorry, you're on the embankment now, but that's what happens when you try to use that lane that's only for merging. We, we check out the, the lanes to make sure that we can get there quickly. We, we, we check out the, the checkout line at the store and make sure that that person has less than 15 items because they should not be in that line if they, if they have more. Oh, this lady in front of me this week did the funniest thing. You know, you know when the checker, they open a new line and they go, oh, next, next customer over here? She had already... Maybe they're here. Were you here? <laughs> she already had her, her things on the, the belt. You don't do that. It's the next person with their items in their cart you move over. But you know, so they had to move all of her things one by one over the... I thought, and this is in the 15 item lane. This is not right. It's, oh my gosh. <sighs> okay. So anyway, so I have this disease called the hurry disease and, and I want to do things faster. I want to get things done. We drove up to, I mentioned earlier, we drove up to San Luis Obispo. It took us seven hours driving up there. I know. Isn't that sad? <laughs> and on the way home, it took us less than five hours. Don't you think I felt really good about the fact that it only took us five hours? You know what it keeps us from doing? All that, this hurry disease, is keeps us from actually experiencing the moment. <sighs> Here we are. This is the moment we have. I'm not worrying about what happened in the past. I'm not worrying about what might happen in the future. I'm in this moment. And I can experience God as God. Solitude, listening to God's voice, is finding a space where we can be quiet before God. Now, for me, finding a place like that is my, my backyard, sitting in a chair in my backyard, looking at my hillside, because my hillside reminds me of my fallen nature, uh, with the weeds and all that doesn't grow there. Uh, but it's a quiet place where all I hear are the birds. And if I don't grab the paper before I sit down. I can actually have a time of quiet. I slow down, and I can listen to what God might want to say to me. Jesus set an example. Scripture says that it was his habit to get away, to spend time alone with God. And that time could simply be five or ten minutes. It doesn't have to be a long time, but time for us to slow down to remember that God is God. John Ortberg in his book has this quote that I think is profound for us. He says, For most of us, the danger is, that, is not that we will renounce our faith. It's that we will become so distracted and rushed and preoccupied that we will settle for a mediocre version of it. Hurry will destroy your soul. Love and hurry are fundamentally Incompatible. I think Diana Ross uh, said that first, didn't she? You can't hurry love. Didn't she sing that? You can't hurry love. You just got to wait. Okay. Hurry and love are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time. Hurry kills love. Hurry prevents us from receiving love from the Father or giving it to his children. In the final analysis... Hurry is not just a disordered schedule. Hurry is a disordered heart. We grow in solitude, listening to God's voice. Jesus says, if you remain in me, remaining requires nothing of us. It doesn't mean that we do anything. Remaining means we practice being in God's presence. Jesus goes on in verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. The second uh, personal spiritual practice is we grow in Scripture, reading His Word into our lives. Bible reading. How many of you would have guessed that was the second practice? Bible reading. Reading Scripture. Reading Scripture into our lives. If his words remain in us. So what do we get from God's word? Allowing his word to dwell in us, which, by the way, means that this is not just an occasional experience, but this is a regular discipline. 
that his word remains in us. What do we get from his word? I think we get encouragement. Encouragement that reminds us who we are in Christ. We have a world that tells us where our identity is found in so many different things. And yet God's word tells us who we are in Christ. It gives us correction that leads to confession. It gives us information that reminds us of what is true about life and about God and about us. Scripture tells us that Scripture helps us to mature. Whether it's spiritual milk or meat, that those who are immature are encouraged to take the spiritual food of God's Word, to grow into maturity. Scripture is a great tool for us that we need to know how to use. Paul writes to Timothy, his protege, he says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. How do we understand and apply God's word? That's a tool that we need to become good at, and we only become good at it as we allow ourselves to dwell, to remain, allow his word to remain in us. The third, anybody have a guess what the third is? Solitude, scripture reading, and Prayer. Duh. See, you all heard this at junior high camp. You've known this. As I said, this is not rocket science, but the application of this is what's most challenging for us. In prayer, asking for guidance and confessing our sin. Asking for guidance and confessing our sin. You know... The psalmist says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God's word helps us to see where we're going. In prayer, we get to ask God for the help that we know he wants to give us. We ask him for guidance. God, help me in this situation. And you could list all of the situations that you really need help in. We all need help in. We need to ask God for help. The more we ask God for guidance, the more we grow spiritually because we're depending on him and his leading in our lives. And, and secondly, in prayer, to, to confess our sins. There's something that happens to us physically, emotionally, spiritually, as we confess our sins and we experience the forgiveness that God wants us to experience in prayer. Psalm 32 says, Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore... Let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. Solitude, scripture reading, and prayer. Each of you received a bookmark when you came in today. I'd like you to pull that out. We designed this tool to help us make a commitment. Last week I asked you if you would jump in and commit yourself to being in worship and being a... a, engage in this series. Today, I want to ask you to jump in and begin practicing these personal uh, spiritual practices that we would all commit to being in solitude, reading scripture, and praying. And what we've done is develop this tool. On one side are the instructions on how to do that, or very simple. And on the back side, you have scripture selections. And these are all keyed with the message series to to help you go deeper in your own understanding of God's word and how it relates to what we've talked about today. What I'd like you to do on your outline is I'd like you to write three words down and allow some space afterwards to write in there. When, I want you to write the word where, and I want you to write the word who. Next to when, I'd like you to write the time of day tomorrow that you're going to commit to spending at least 10 minutes in solitude, scripture reading, and prayer. A time tomorrow that works best for you. Don't worry about what's going to work for the next seven weeks. What will work for you tomorrow? So for me, it's going to be about 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. That's the time I think I can set aside 10 minutes, at least 10 minutes. Now, for some of you, you've done this so long, you already have a quiet time. Great. Awesome. You might want to just adopt this for your quiet time. For others of us, you actually feel like I said last week, sit, standing on the ledge of a 30-foot cliff. I've never done this before. I've never actually committed myself to spending time with the Lord in quiet, in scripture reading, 
in prayer. This is an opportunity for you to take a jump, take a leap of faith, and try it. Commit. So uh, when? Write down a time. Where? What is the place you're going to find yourself at that time tomorrow? It might be in the morning. It could be at lunch. Someone told me after the service, uh, first service, he can close his door at lunchtime. He will not be disturbed. He can sit there at his desk, and that's where he can have his time of quiet with God. It might be in the evening at the end of the day. So when and where? Where is the place you're going to find yourself? For me, it's going to be sitting in my backyard. Where is it for you? And then who? Who are you going to tell that you're going to do this tomorrow? One of the great things of community is that we can encourage each other to grow. So there you go. When, where, and who? I hope that everybody's filled that out. And I want you to commit today. I want to encourage you to commit for the next seven weeks so that this series, as we begin to talk about doing for God, as we begin to talk about being sent into the world, I want our foundation not to be in our doing. I want our foundation to be in our being. And here's why. Because unless we are connected to the vine, unless we as branches are connected to the vine, we will not bear God's fruit. What will motivate, inspire, and inform the doing of our lives? Will it be our own already formed opinions about what's going on in the world and what God does and who we are? Will it be our political affiliation and what we think ought to be done in the world? Will it be my own biases and prejudices? Will it be the lessons that I learned years ago? Or will it be the vital relationship that I have with God right now? The world does not need more people doing for God who are not connected to Him. God needs people who are first connected to Him. And their doing flows out of their being with Him. You know, Jesus says something interesting here about what the Father does with the branches, and I've always seen that as a judgment, which is true. If you're gardening, you prune the branches that aren't bearing fruit. Why would you allow them to take up space? And there is truth to that, that God cannot use us unless we're bearing his fruit, unless we remain in him. He cannot use us. But the other is just a practical reality. What do you do with branches that don't bear fruit? They really are better served elsewhere. In this passage, Jesus is talking to his disciples, not just about their personal happiness, but how they're going to participate with what God wants to do in the world, with the demonstration of the fruit of the kingdom of God that has to be more compelling than the fruitfulness of this world. And we, individually and collectively, get to be a part of that great venture. Let's pray together. God, we sit in solitude right now and ask you to speak to each of us. And we've read your word today. And that word might be a word of encouragement to some of us. It might be a word of aspiration, what we want to become. It might be a word of correction. So we ask for your guidance. We ask you to show us the way. Some of us have never 
taken the time to sit with you, God. Show us the way how to do that. Show us. Help us to have courage knowing that you're leading us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you would encourage our hearts as we sit quietly. And for, for, for those of us for whom this is a word of correction, God, we ask you to forgive our sins. Our sin of hurriedness, of busyness, of fear that we just won't get it all done. We confess our sin of pride that says we can do this ourselves. We can bear our own fruit. We don't need you, God. Forgive us. Wash us clean. Jesus, thank you for your reminder today that you are the vine and that we are the branches. You are the vine and we are the branches. Help us to remain in you, not for our sake, but for your sake, for the sake of the world that you loved enough to die for it. We commit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you ready to jump? Let's, let's, let's jump together. Let's be a community of faith that is connected to the source of life, of hope, of salvation, of justice, of peace, of prosperity, of power, of protection. Let's be a community that remains connected to him. This week it might be 10 minutes a day. You might have the freedom to expand that. Someone after the first service said, I, now I spend two hours in the morning. I never thought I would be doing this. Let's stay connected to him. Let's go with the blessing of God, the Father Almighty, who created each one of us in love so that our lives would be for the praise of his glory. And the blessing of his son, Jesus, who demonstrated the full extent of his love by serving us and laying down his life for us. And the blessing of God, the Holy Spirit, who goes with us to keep us connected to the vine. Amen? Amen. Amen.